Section 24 of The Age of Anne by Edward Ellis Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 22, Literature, Part 1. Section 1, French Literature. The age of Louis XIV is often called the Augustan age of French literature. That name compares it with the time when, under the rule and patronage of Augustus, Roman literature reached its most polished, if not its most original, epoch, and when the masterpieces of most of the great Latin authors were written. The period is often made to include works which really belong to earlier times. Nor did the system of state patronage begin with Louis. Some of his predecessors had encouraged literature. To one of them, Cardinal Richelieu, France owes the establishment of the Academy, which itself, to a great extent the creature of patronage, was intended in a sense to be the vehicle of the king's patronage to others. Pensions were freely bestowed on authors, and literature was intended to become a branch of the civil service. The Academy was to draw up a code of laws for the literary, by producing treatises on rhetoric and poetics, and to compile a dictionary of the French language, which in the seventeenth century was assuming its present shape. Patronage certainly cannot create genius any more than rules can make a poet. It is within its power to promote culture, but it will be found that its tendency is to dwarf genius. Despotism cannot give genius, but it can stifle it, for really great men will not long endure to live in the atmosphere of a despotic court and to shape their voices only to speech that is agreeable there. They may for a time be content to dedicate their works to a king who is their paymaster and to let their dedications be fulsome. Racine died in disgrace because he spoke out against the miserable condition of the French peasantry, and Boileau left the court saying, What should I do there? I know not how to flatter. It is impossible to separate from the system of patronage the most marked characteristic of the era that everything must be done according to rule. If patronage stifled genius on one side, rules stifled it on the other. The drama was hidebound by the doctrine of the three unities, of time, of place, and of action, fetters to which Shakespeare had never subjected his genius. It was an age in which poetry was reduced to an art that is a body of rules which can be taught. Boileau, in imitation of Horace, wrote the art of poetry. Pope, in turn, in the so-called Augustan age in England, copied Boileau as well as Horace in the essay on criticism. An instructive lesson with respect to the age of Louis the Fourteenth is to be learnt in the fact that its great authors and artists fell within the first half of it. The year 1688, which witnessed the English Revolution, divides the real reign of Louis the Fourteenth, that is, the time during which he himself governed into two equal halves. It has been noticed that almost all the great ornaments of the time died before this year. It would seem to follow that the effects of patronage are only spasmodic and not permanent. The literary greatness of the reign was over at the same time as its military successes, and with the beginning of the new century, and in the general misery of the Spanish Succession War, the character of the literature changed. A new epoch had begun whose tone breathed rebellion against the previous spirit. It is, however, necessary to sketch and outline the prominent features of the literature of the whole reign in order to understand both its results and the rebellion against its influence. First, the reign was very strong in drama having, besides minor authors, three illustrious dramatists, Moliere, Corneille, and Racine, of whom the first wrote comedies, the other two chiefly tragedies. At first Moliere seems only to have had in view the amusement of an audience, but he soon learnt that the poet should also teach. Whilst standing well with the court, he attacked, in an exquisitely ludicrous style, the follies and foibles of the day at one time the pedantic affectation of the learned women, 
at another the cumbrous and antiquated jargon of the doctors, then the pious hypocrite, the citizen who imitated the nobility, or the frivolous noble. Corneille has the title of father of French tragedy. He is distinguished for simplicity. He paints the conflict between private and public passions, the conflict between love and honor, or religion or duty. He drew both the subjects of his plays and his method of treatment from Spain, whilst Racine, who succeeded him, drew his inspiration rather from ancient Greece. In his hands, French tragedy was framed upon Greek models, and almost all his subjects are taken either from classical or from sacred antiquity. Andromaque was his first, and Atali his last play. His plays are remarkable for grace of expression, rhythm, and correctness. He always conforms to the three unities, that there shall be no impossibilities on the stage, no asking the audience to pass over time or space. The age of Louis the Fourteenth is secondly famous for the development of French prose, and therein especially for the composition of letters and of memoirs. The letters of Madame de Sevigné and the memoirs of the Duc de Saint-Simon, chief chamberlain at the king's court, may be selected as representatives. The former are witty, tender, and always in good taste. The latter, which belong perhaps rather to a later age, are full of gossip of this and the succeeding reign. Every species of anecdote, everything small and great being recorded by a vivacious eyewitness. It was to be expected that theology would flourish, but it was for the most part a courtly theology and inspired by the Jesuits. The eloquence of the pulpit became very famous. Bossuet, Bishop of Meaux, was the chief of the preachers, and his excellence lay especially in funeral orations. Basue may be said to have applied to religion the teaching which Louis inculcated in politics. With him, all opposition was wrong, whether it took the form of Protestantism and absolute revolt from the Church, or the minor form of holding different views within her pale. Such a revolt was shown in Pascal, who, after displaying a precocious and extraordinary genius for mathematics at an early age, turned his attention to theology, and just before Louis took up the reins of government, published his provincial letters, a book which attacked the teaching and views of the Jesuits. Pascal belonged to a sect called the Jansenists, because its members held certain views first promulgated by Bishop Jansenius on the subject of predestination. There was a fierce controversy between them and the Jesuits, but the latter, having the ear of the papal court, were enabled to procure from the Pope a bull against their opponents. It was called from its first word the Bull Unigenitus, dated September 1713, in which the Jansenists were condemned, and the king insisted on the acceptance of the bull throughout France. One of the leading theologians was Fenelon, Archbishop of Cambrai. On account of the saintliness of his character, he had been appointed tutor to the young Duke of Burgundy. Telemaque is a book which he wrote for the use of his pupil, and under veil of describing antiquity, it contains a strong condemnation of the government, as well as a sort of program for reform, which his pupil would probably have carried out if he had reached the throne. As a result of the age of Louis the Fourteenth, the French language acquired a great ascendancy in Europe. It became the language of diplomacy and of polite society. Its influence upon English literature is well worth notice. Pope, the leading poet of the time, shows many traces of a study of French writers. Addison spent a long time in France, and one can see the same influence in his polished and easy style. After the Peace of Utrecht, the current of influence seemed to pass the other way. Many Frenchmen visited England, and conceived the greatest admiration for the spirit of English politics, English laws, and English society. It would be hardly too much to say that some of the seeds of the French Revolution were sown in their minds, and the admiration first acquired, of which they afterwards gave such practical expression, of the way in which the English treated their kings in general, and Charles I in particular. 
When Louis the Fourteenth died, Voltaire was a young man just of age, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau was in the nursery. Though the former never quite shook off his feeling of reverence for the king, one cannot help feeling that it was opposition to the spirit of the French government and knowledge of its results that led both these thinkers and writers to fan the spirit of liberty, so that here also the revolution was being prepared, though there were years and years of weary misgovernment before its outbreak. Section 2. English Literature The reign of Queen Anne, likewise, is usually called the Augustan Age of English Literature. It was a time when England was as great in literature as in war. Writers of deeper tone and weightier caliber have lived at other times, but there is probably no period so short in which so many famous books have been given to the world, or in which forces have had their roots destined so powerfully to influence the future. There are many who regard the name as wholly inappropriate, for the Latin literature was fostered by the judicious patronage of Augustus. However great may be the affection of posterity for good Queen Anne, it cannot be included among her virtues that she cared for or helped literature. But Augustus was assisted in the exercise of his patronage by the taste and discrimination of his great minister Mycenas. Was there then a Mycenas in Queen Anne's reign? Was there any influential subject who made it his pride and his pleasure to help men of letters? The only subject who could be compared in extent of power to Mycenas was Marlborough, and he did not care for poetry and was nervously sensitive to the least attack on himself. But if there was no one great patron standing out above the rest, alike prominent and anxious to make the assistance of literature his glory, it would yet be fair to say that the time of Queen Anne was, like the Augustan age, a time of patronage, a time not of one, but of many patrons. There probably never was a time in which successful literature was so well rewarded, probably never a time in which the alliance was so close between politicians and literary men. Intimacy even must have been great, when a poet like Pryor and a statesman like Bolingbroke would write to and of each other as Matt and Harry. Pope was the representative poet of the age, and he is proud to boast of his friendly intercourse with Bolingbroke, who supplied him with the subject matter of one of his greatest poems, and of the assistance that Peterborough gave him in gardening. There my retreat the best companions grace, chiefs out of war and statesmen out of place. There St. John mingles with my friendly bowl the feast of reason and the flow of soul. And he whose lightning pierced the Iberian lines now forms my quincunx and now ranks my vines, or tames the genius of the stubborn plain almost as quickly as he conquered Spain. No statesman out of place probably ever had nobler eulogy passed upon him than that with which Pope honored Harley a soul supreme in each hard instance tried, above all pain, all passion, and all pride, the rage of power, the blast of public breath, the lust of lucre, and the dread of death. Alexander Pope was born in 1688, the year of the Revolution. His father was a London linen draper who, on retiring from business, went to live near Windsor. The boy was deformed and almost a dwarf, Throughout his life he suffered a great deal from disease. An undercurrent of unhappiness caused by his bodily ailments, and a nervous irritability which is not uncommon with very short men, can be traced through all his life. Unable to engage in the sports of boyhood, he showed poetical talents at a very early age. I lisped in numbers, for the numbers came. So great was his reverence for Dryden, the poet of his boyhood, that in the last year of the seventeenth century, when he was twelve years old, at his own expressed desire, he was taken up to London to Will's Coffee House in order to see him. Dryden died in that very year. His mantle and a double portion of his spirit fell upon Pope. The following are his most famous works given in the order in which they were composed. Essay on Criticism. Reap of the Lock, 
Messiah, translation of Homer's Iliad and part of the Odyssey, Dunciad, Essay on Man, Imitations of Horace, and Epistles. Most of these were written after the reign of Anne, at the time of whose death he was engaged in translating the Iliad. The essay on criticism may be said to be an imitation of the Ars Poetica of Horace. But there is this difference between the writers. Horace was an experienced and practiced poet, Pope a young man of twenty-three. Though the former may claim the palm for originality in the treatment of such a subject, honor must also be given to the genius of the young man, which enabled him to utter thoughts worthy of the wisdom of age. The Rape of the Lock is a playful poem, mock heroic. It has been called the true epic of the time. A young cavalier of the court cut a lock of hair from off the head of a beautiful maid of honor. The place that the gods occupy in epic poems, Pope supplies, in this airy pleasantry, with sylphs and gnomes, and the whole subject is treated in so graceful a style that the poem may serve as a model for this species of composition. On Pope's Homer, his best-known work, but not his greatest work, his contemporary Bentley, the greatest classical critic of all time, has passed a criticism to which even now we can add nothing. A very pretty poem, Mr. Pope, but please don't call it Homer. The sonorous dignity of the original and its natural freedom have vanished and been replaced by the stiffness of an artificial style. But it is the work of a true poet, and if it does not reproduce Homer, is yet well worth reading for its own sake. It is said that Lord Bolingbroke supplied Pope with the material out of which he composed the four epistles that form the Essay on Man, a treatise on the relation of man to the universe, to himself and to society, and on man's pursuit of happiness. The matter is, however, certainly the least valuable portion of it. As to treatment, it may be regarded as Pope's masterpiece. The merits of Pope's poetry shine forth in it. These merits, not being originality or sympathy with nature or insight into character, virtues which distinguish greater poets, but grace, smoothness, correctness, the perfection of taste. He pays infinite attention to the form of his verses, making the subject matter a secondary consideration. His lines remind one of the exquisite chiseling of a master sculptor. In few English poets can we find such melody of rhythm. Dr. Johnson compares his prose to that of Dryden in language, which may be applied also to their poems. The style of Dryden is capricious and varied, that of Pope is cautious and uniform. Dryden is sometimes vehement and rapid, Pope is always smooth, uniform, and gentle. Dryden's page is a natural field rising into inequalities and diversified by the varied exuberance of abundant vegetation. Pope's is a velvet lawn shaven by the scythe and leveled by the roller. Pope's influence upon English poetry may be said to have lasted to the end of the century, and it cannot be regarded as beneficial. Poetry consists of two parts, the outward form and the inward meaning. Some writers have neglected one, some the other. The absence of heart and of nature in the poetry of the last century seems to be due to imitation of Pope, for his style is like Ulysses' bow, it requires a master's hand to make it really effective. End of section 24. Section 25 of The Age of Anne by Edward Ellis Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 22, Literature, Part 2. The real strength, however, of the age of Anne lay not in poetry, but in prose, and its prose still more than its poetry influenced the times that followed and is making its influence still felt in our own day. There was a close alliance between politics and literature, but politics took more than ever the form of party politics. A great development had taken place in parties, for not only was there the contest between Whigs and Tories, and side by side with it, the sister contest between Low and High Church, 
but also there was a new aspect of the fight between the inns and the outs. Before the end of the reign it came to be understood that all the ministers should be of one party, whilst the other was in opposition. This gave a new, almost a pecuniary, interest to the contest. If there was no Augustus and no Mycenas, party spirit took their place. The elections to the House of Commons were all important, and the question arose, how were they to be influenced? Nowadays, elections still being of importance, more influence is due to the speeches of a few eminent men, delivered in Parliament or in public places, and to the articles in the newspaper, than to the views of candidates at each election. But at the outset of Queen Anne's reign there were hardly any newspapers and no reporters. Nay, more, there was a law against reporting, and valuable debates are in consequence wholly lost to history. Even in our own times, the practice lasted that any member might exclude reporters by merely calling the Speaker's attention to their presence. Members of Parliament might be influenced by speeches. Those outside could be reached only by pamphlets. Able pens were therefore in demand for pamphlet writing, and able men, whether they liked it or not, were compelled to declare for a party. It is quite true that the best literary men protested against this compulsion. Swift made it a point in his satire of the contest between the Big Endians and the Little Endians. Addison humorously tells of the boy who, asking his way, was abused by one as a popish cur in asking for St. Anne's Lane, and cuffed for irreverence when he asked for Anne's Lane. Pope protests vehemently that the matters are not worth the fighting for. For forms of government let fools contest, whatever is best administered is best. Pamphlets were not a new invention. Our great Milton during the middle stage of his life was a pamphleteer, but the profusion with which pamphlets were poured forth was new and formed a marked character of the time. We are so much accustomed to our daily papers that we sometimes wonder how people used to get on without them. At Athens of old, they supplied the want by conversation in the marketplace. In Queen Anne's reign it was done partly by pamphlets, partly by clubs and coffee-houses, which were beginning to have considerable influence on political and social life. The greatest pamphleteer, probably the greatest genius of his time, was Jonathan Swift. He was of English extraction, but born and educated in Dublin. At the age of twenty-one, in the year of the Revolution, he entered the service of Sir William Temple, a distant kinsman, apparently in the capacity of secretary. His position seems to have been unpleasant to him, for he left it and took holy orders, but he returned to it again, and though not proud of the connection, yet he edited Temple's works when his patron died. Temple had retired from political life, but was often consulted by William the Third when the king wanted an opinion less interested than that of the partisans who surrounded him. King William taught Swift how to cut asparagus in the Dutch fashion, and offered him a coronetcy and a troop of horse. It is said also that his name was entered in William's notebook for preferment, but William died, and Swift's own conduct prevented preferment coming from the king's successor. His first work was The Tale of a Tub, a very ludicrous story of three brothers, Peter, Jack, and Martin, who represent respectively the Roman Catholic, the Calvinist, and the Lutheran religion. The story is told of their attempts to carry out their father's wishes in agreement, and of their quarrel at the Reformation. The whole tendency of the book was to cast ridicule upon religion. Failing in his efforts for promotion, Swift changed his party, and went over to the Tories, who received him with open arms, but the Queen would not consent to the wish of her ministers to make him a bishop. Ultimately, he was appointed Dean of St. Patrick's, Dublin. He was naturally of a sour temper, and the continued disappointments of his life made him very bitter. He is a furious assailant, sparing no insult to gain his point. He seems to have had little heart. His humour is wonderful, such that no English writer has ever equalled it. Ireland alone could have produced it. 
one could desire no addition to it but a little kindliness. His pamphlets were indispensable to the historian of the reign of Queen Anne. Their name is Legion. One of them probably had greater influence than any other pamphlet ever had. When the Whigs were turned out of office, the public opinion in England, especially in the city, was still strongly in favor of the prosecution of the war. The effect of the conduct of the Allies, showing that the English people were paying the Allies that they should be allowed to fight their battles for them, was magical in turning the tide of opinion. Stocks fell when the Whigs were turned out, stocks were unaffected by the cessation of arms which showed that negotiations were genuine in king george's reign swift wrote the drapier's letters against a new government coinage and the result was that the coinage was withdrawn whilst swift became the darling of the irish people but of course swift's really greatest work is gulliver's travels which may be described as a satire upon humanity with contemporary allusions in the voyage to Lilliput is represented the littleness of mankind, as seen by beings of a larger growth. In Brobdenag, the absurdities of men are shown, seen, as it were, through a magnifying glass. Then Gulliver travels to other lands wherein learning and science are satirized, and at length Swift bursts forth into terrible descriptions of the Yahoos, which read like a savage attack on mankind. Swift outlived his genius, and before his death sank into absolute idiocy. The story is told how toward the end of his life he took up one of his own books and read, Good God, what a genius I had when I wrote that book. So Swift expired a driveler and a show. The following epitaph in St. Patrick's Cathedral he composed for himself. Hic Jacket Jonathan Swift, S.T.P ubi saiwa indignatio cor ulterius lacerari nequit, abi viator imitare si poteris. Swift was the great Tory pamphleteer famous as the author of Gulliver. A writer on the Whig side was none other than the author of Robinson Crusoe. Daniel Defoe was born in 1661, the year after the Restoration. His real name was Foe, for though he had this strange fancy for prefixing de to his name, he was a true-born Englishman. His father was a London butcher, a Whig, and a dissenter, and he himself engaged in business as a hosier. But his strong sympathy with that extreme section of the Whig party which the dissenters formed soon drew him from commerce, in which he was unsuccessful, to literature. He had a very facile pen, and it often got him into trouble. But neither pillory nor imprisonment could restrain him from writing again. As a faithful and extreme Whig, he had joined Monmouth and taken refuge abroad after the defeat of Sedgemoor. He was a great friend of the glorious revolution, and during the reign of William was always ready to defend the king in his cause, even with respect to acts which were unpopular. His career as a pamphleteer may be said to have begun one year before the Revolution and to have ended about a year after the end of Queen Anne's reign. The two most famous of his pamphlets are The True-Born Englishman, which appeared in the former, and The Shortest Way with Dissenters in the latter. The True-Born Englishman is a poem in which Defoe defends King William. The verse is not melodious and may be said in parts to descend to doggerel, but its sterling sense caused a very big sale. Considering the services that William and his Dutch soldiers had conferred upon England, even a true-born Englishman can forgive him for liking his old friends better than his new subjects. The former, at any rate, had been true to him. The foreigners have faithfully obeyed him, and none but Englishmen have e'er betrayed him. The writer vigorously maintains the principles of the revolution against the tyranny which James had wished to establish. The claims of kings should be broad, based upon their people's will. Titles are shadows, crowns are empty things. The good of subjects is the end of kings.
The shortest way with dissenters was a pamphlet called forth by the occasional conformity bill. The church party, knowing that the queen was on their side, were anxious to persecute the dissenters until they were entirely rid of them. They wished legislation to run in the groove of Charles II's reign, not in that of William's. Defoe wrote under the guise of a churchman, and his shortest way was this, if one severe law were made and punctually executed, that whoever was found at a conventicle should be banished the nation, and the preacher be hanged, we should soon see an end of the tale. The churchmen were delighted, and Defoe had to publish an explanation of his sarcasm, at which they were proportionately enraged. The result was the pillory and imprisonment. The pamphlet is really an argument in favor of complete toleration, for he also attacks his own friends, the dissenters, because when they had the power they did not respect their opponents. Now, like the cock in the stable, they are quite willing to propose to the horses, let us all keep our legs quiet. Defoe's greatest work is, of course, Robinson Crusoe. He was nearly sixty when he wrote it. It is founded upon the adventures of Alexander Selkirk, a seaman who had been marooned upon the island of Juan Fernandez, that is to say, put on shore by his captain and left there on pretense that he had committed some great crime. The adventures of Robinson Crusoe, his shipwreck, his life upon the island, his attempts to provide himself with the common necessaries of life, his meeting with Friday, the boat too big to launch, and ultimately the escape, have delighted many generations of readers, young as well as old. Written in an exceedingly simple style, it has all the air of a real narrative. But the most famous Whig of the time, and one whose life is closely mixed up with its history, is Joseph Addison. He was educated at the Charter House, which was then, and indeed until late years, a London school, but has now been moved into the country. A modern novelist himself educated at the same school writes with great pride of Addison as the head boy at the Charter House. Addison distinguished himself at school and went thence to Oxford, where he obtained a fellowship at Magdalen College. He had a great reputation for Latin scholarship and especially for Latin verses. He also tried English verses, and some of them, arresting the attention of Lord Somers, that enlightened nobleman procured Addison a pension, wherewith he travelled over France and Italy. He stayed a long time in France, and the influence of a close acquaintance with French literature can be plainly traced in Addison's style. On King William's death, the pension ceased, and he returned to England. He published an account of his travels which was not successful, and for some years Addison lived in poor but dignified and contented retirement, in lodgings in the Haymarket, up two pairs of stairs. When the Battle of Blenheim was fought, its glory was sung by many poetasters in miserable verses, which seemed to the ministers to mar it. Godolphin, the Prime Minister, did not know to whom to turn. A Whig nobleman suggested an application to Addison, on condition that all due respect be shown in making it. The Chancellor of the Exchequer was sent as a deputation to Addison, who consented to write, and when the Chancellor came again, the poem was completed as far as the following passage. But, O oh my muse, what numbers wilt thou find to sing the furious troops in battle joined? Methinks I hear the drum's tumultuous sound, the victor's shouts and dying groans confound. The dreadful burst of cannon rend the skies, and all the thunder of the battle rise. T'was then great Marlborough's mighty soul was proved, that in the shock of charging hosts unmoved, amidst confusion, horror, and despair, examined all the dreadful scenes of war. In peaceful thought the field of death surveyed, two fainting squadrons sent the timely aid, inspired repulsed battalions to engage, and taught the doubtful battle where to rage. So when an angel, by divine command, with rising tempests shakes a guilty land, such as of late o'er pale Britannia passed, calm and serene he drives the furious blast, 
and pleased the Almighty's orders to perform, rides in the whirlwind and directs the storm. This simile carried the minister away with enthusiasm, and the same feeling was quickly spread through the country when the whole poem called The Campaign was published. All the critics allow that the merit of the rest of the poem is by no means equal to that of this passage, and that its great praise is that it recognizes the truth that in a modern battle the general does not engage hand in hand with the enemy and slay thousands with his own sword, but is the directing mind of the whole. By this poem, Addison's career was made. He was appointed in turn Commissioner of Appeals, Secretary to Legation at Hanover, Under Secretary of State, Secretary for Ireland, and ultimately, three years after the accession of King George I, Secretary of State. He married the Countess of Warwick, to whose son he had formerly been tutor, and lived at Holland House, which has been for many generations the haunt of a brilliant literary society. The character of Addison has made him almost the model of a literary man. He had only one weakness, inability to resist the temptation of wine, and that was perhaps the fault of his age rather than of himself. He was humane, genial, modest, and in the best sense of the word religious. The wits of his day used to call him a parson in a tie wig, the layman's wig, as we might say, a clergyman in a black tie. Indeed, the benevolent morality of his writings and their earnest Christianity have probably had more effect for good than many sermons. Pope quarreled with Addison and inserted in one of his poems the following magnificent declamation against him. Peace to all such, but were there one whose fires true genius kindles and fair fame inspires, blessed with each talent and each art to please, and born to write, converse, and live with ease? Should such a man, too fond to rule alone, bear like the Turk no brother near the throne, view him with scornful yet with jealous eyes, and hate for arts which caused himself to rise? Damn with faint praise, assent with civil leer, and without sneering teach the rest to sneer willing to wound and yet afraid to strike, just hint a fault and hesitate dislike, alike reserved to blame or to commend a timorous foe and a suspicious friend, dreading e'en fools by flatterers besieged, and so obliging that he ne'er obliged, like Cato give his little senate laws and sit attentive to his own applause, while wits and templars every sentence raise, and wonder with a foolish face of praise, who but must laugh if such a man there be, who would not weep if Atticus were he? It is said that in the first draft Addison's name stood without even the veil of Atticus. There can, however, be no doubt that this attack was very unfair and proceeded from the spiteful venom of the poet. It is quite true that Addison had a band of faithful admirers, to one of whom we shall presently advert. But jealousy was not Addison's failing, though it was Pope's. The allusion to Cato would show that the passage was intended for Addison, even if there were no direct evidence. Cato was the name of Addison's simple tragedy. It was first acted in 1713, the month after the Peace of Utrecht was concluded, a great deal of it had been written much earlier, but the play was only recently finished. Pope, then friendly to Addison, wrote a prologue to it, and as Addison surrendered all the profit of the performance to the actors, they did their best to make it a success. It was a time when party feeling ran very high. The Whigs applauded every passage in praise of liberty, and the Tories, not to be outdone, applauded also. Marlborough's application to be made Captain General for life being fresh in men's memories, Lord Bolingbroke made a capital hit by sending for the chief actor between the acts and presenting him with a purse of fifty pounds for defending the cause of liberty so well against a perpetual dictator. The saying went round the Tory benches that the Whigs meant to make as good a present when they could accompany it with as good a speech. The play is constructed after French models, and is certainly neither admired nor read in the present day. 
it is too frigid, but a few lines from it shall pass as the current coin of everyday quotation. A fellow worker on the same side and intimately connected with Addison was Mr. Richard Steele. They were educated at the same school and were contemporaries and friends at Oxford, but whilst Addison was steady and distinguished himself, Steele was idle. At length, no longer able to bear the restraints of Oxford life, he ran away and enlisted as a private in the Blues. Later he obtained a cornetcy, and we find him afterwards a captain in the Fusiliers. Steele's name, like Swift's, was down in William's notebook for promotion, but William's death destroyed the value of the entry. It has been said of Steele that he spent his life in sinning and repenting. Whilst notorious for his gaiety and the dissipation of his life, he astonished the town by bringing out a little book called The Christian Hero, which breathes the very spirit of piety. When his party was in power, places were found for him, and at length Sir Richard Steele was appointed editor of the Gazette. It occurred to him that the early information which he thus obtained might be made of use in a paper, and that the dullness of news might be relieved by an occasional essay on some subject not political. This idea took form in the Tatler, which, when the Whigs lost office and Steele his place, was merged afterwards in the more famous Spectator, in which Steele received great assistance from Addison. The share which Addison and Steele had in this constitutes their chief claims upon the notice of posterity. It was a small sheet published three times a week at the price of one penny, containing a short essay on two of the pages and news on the others. The subjects of the essays were infinitely varied, now were criticism on manners, now on the hoops worn by ladies, on the absurd practice of their wearing patches on the face, or on cherry-coloured ribbons. These lighter subjects would be matched by reflections on Westminster Abbey, on the exchange, on the bank, or by criticisms of decided value on Milton's Paradise Lost and on the old ballad of Chevy Chase. But a sort of thread of connection was given to the papers by the character of the spectator, a quiet observer of men and manners, and by the account of the club, with its types of English society of the day, the first sketch of which is due to Steele. The character of Sir Roger de Coverley, its leading member, the representative of the English country gentleman, was adopted and improved by Addison, who wrote all the later papers about him, until Steele again tried his hand, placing the old knight in improper company, and to prevent such a liberty being taken, Addison wrote a very touching account of his death. The influence of the spectator has been very remarkable. One may regard the modern newspaper and the modern magazine as its children. For newspapers combine criticism with news, magazines present essays without the news. Surely the most significant feature of modern literature is to be found in the merit and profusion of its periodicals that are poured forth daily, weekly, monthly from the press. Their transparent fault is that they are transitory, but the gain is that knowledge, which once remained upon the mountain height, is now brought down to water the plain. Who shall measure their influence? End of section 25. Recording by Pamela Nagami in Encino, California, October 2nd, in the year of the plague, 2020. End of the Age of Anne by Edward Ellis Morris.